everybody. Uh, my name is Iqbal Khan. I am a technology evangelist at Alachisoft. Um, and uh, we are a software company based in... Uh, where do we go? So, we're a software company based in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, NCash is our flagship product, which is a distributed cache. That's why I'm talking about this topic today. My topic is not about NCash, it's about caching in general. Uh, NOSDB is another product that we have. It's an open source NoSQL database for .NET. <clears throat> and I'm going to use Azure uh, for uh, demonstrating a distributed cache so that you guys can see how it is actually used. Um, so uh, today's topic is uh, scaling .NET applications for distributed caching. Um, I prefer to have a more interactive discussion. So as I'm talking, if you guys have a question, please raise your hand so we can talk about that right at that point instead of waiting until the end. I find that makes it a much more meaningful conversation. So, um, so let me get started now. Uh, okay. So we're going to go through a few definitions. I'm sure most of you know this already, but just for completionist, uh, completion purposes, um, the first definition is scalability. Uh, scalability is high application performance under peak loads. So if you have, uh, let's say, an ASP.NET application or any .NET application that performs super fast with, let's say, five users, it's not necessarily scalable. Of course, if it doesn't perform fast with five users, then you have other problems than not uh, than this. Um, but most applications do perform super fast um, with five users. But it's when you go to 5,000 or 50,000 or 500,000 users, that's when things really start to break down. Um, so you want the, the, if you want your application to be scalable, it must perform under peak loads. Uh, linear scalability uh, means that your application architecture, your deployment strategy, um, if it is done in such a way that adding more servers gives you an incremental uh, capacity of handling more transactions, then you are linearly scalable. Uh, that means if you add, if you had with two servers, if you add, let's say, a thousand users with with a three server, you should be have fifteen hundred users or something like that. But if your, if your architecture or deployment is not linearly scalable, it is going to look more like a logarithmic curve, which, is, which goes up and down, which means that after a certain point, it doesn't really matter if you add more servers, uh, it's going to slow things down. If, you're, if you have more transactions, you just can't get out. You cannot buy yourself out of that problem, as they say. Um, so you want not only scalability, but linear scalability. Um, the following applications are the ones that usually have these types of issues. These are ASP.NET web applications, uh, these are web services, these are uh, internet uh, IoT backend, which is usually also web services. Uh, you might have big data processing, which is usually not that common in .NET, but you, you know, big data processing is also something that needs to scale. Or any other server applications. Um, you may be a financial institution that uh, has a, a compliance requirement to process a certain number of transactions. Oops, sorry about this. I need to. I forgot to turn on the audio. So, you may um, uh, have a server application that has a compliance requirement to let's say. Let's say if you're a bank wire application, you need to wire the funds before the next business day or, or by a certain time. So you need to be able to process more and more uh, transactions. So if you have one of these applications, then you've come to the right talk. Um, so let's define this scalability problem. Uh, most of you know that your application architectures today, if you have an ASP.NET or web services application, the architecture of the application tier scales very linearly. So you can add more servers, there's usually not a problem. The problem really is with your data storage. And when I use the word data storage, I mean relational databases and mainframe data, legacy data, any data store that you traditionally used. Uh, and that, is become, that becomes a bottleneck, and when it becomes a bottleneck, then you uh, have this problem. Uh, the 
No SQL databases, uh, I was supposed to say they're not always the answer. Uh, I skipped the always here. Uh, but no SQL movement actually started partly because of this, because relational databases were not scalable. So no SQL databases are scalable. Um, but they're not good in all situations uh, because you know, they require you to move all of your data from your existing database into a NoSQL database, which you can do that for a lot of new data, uh, but the traditional business data, your customers, your accounts, uh, all of that data has to stay in relational for both business purpose reasons and for technical reasons. Um, you know, technical reasons, of course, are that a relational database has an ecosystem that is not matched by any NoSQL database. And business reasons are, of course, um, of the same nature. Uh, but so the NoSQL database is not always the answer. And you know, even though we have a NoSQL database product um, that we sell, it's called NoSQL. Uh, that is used only as an augmentation of relational databases. So you cannot get out of relational databases. Relational databases are here to stay. So you need to live with that reality. Um, and so, so you need to solve the scalability with relational databases still being in the picture. The solution, of course, is that you should use an in-memory distributed cache. Um, and cache is uh, one such uh, solution. It's an open source distributed cache. We're the oldest .NET distributed cache in the market. We've been around for the last 10 years, actually 11 now. Um, and uh, we're the only really native .NET cache. Most of you have heard of Redis, right? Yeah. So, but more than two years ago, we didn't, you know, we never heard of Redis because they're really not focused on .NET. It wasn't until Microsoft uh, did a partnership with them for Azure. Um, so, the benefit of a uh, an in-memory distributed cache is that you can use it with your existing databases. So, you can solve that problem uh, that your relational databases are providing you through an in-memory distributed cache. So how do you solve that problem? Um, you solve that problem by, you know, let's see this picture here. So you have uh, an application here, which is your web applications, your web services, or any other server applications. Um, and you can add more servers here. You know, for web applications and web services, they're usually a load balancer up here that I did not draw in this. So you can add more servers at this layer, you cannot add more servers in the database layer. Yes, you can add more servers in the NoSQL layer, but as I said, it's not always the answer. So you have to solve this, these two um, boxes. So you put a, an in-memory distributed cache in between the application tier and the database. Uh, uh, the distributed cache usually forms a cluster. Um, so not all distributed caches form cluster. Memcache never formed a cluster, even though it was seen as a distributed cache. Redis does form a cluster. Mcache definitely does form a cluster. Um, a distributed cache forms a cluster of two or more servers here. Uh, the reason I say two is for redundancy purposes and for replication and for a lot of others, and also for uh, scalability purposes. Uh, if you only need one cache server, you probably don't need a distributed cache. Um, so you should have a minimum of two cache servers here. And this cache cluster actually forms, uh, it, it pulls the memory and the CPU resources from all the cache servers into one logical capacity. Uh, what that means is uh, that as you add more servers, you get more memory, more CPU processing, and more uh, network card capacity. Those are the three bottlenecks to scalability. Memory, CPU, and network card. Uh, network cards these days are, uh, you can, one gigabit or 10 gigabit is pretty much standard. It's pretty hard to max out a, a one gigabit card or, or 10 gigabit unless your object sizes are large. But if your object sizes are large, large means hundreds of kilobytes per object, then it's pretty easy to max out a, memory, uh, a network card if you have a, a lot of traffic. But if you add more servers, then of course that's more network cards. Um, and memory is the same way. Um, the reason it's an in-memory distributed cache is because memory is much faster than disk, um, and uh, you know that's what really adds the value. It's faster, it's more scalable. So the goal here is to capture about 80% of your application access going to the distributed cache, so that only 20% will be left to go to the database. A lot of people uh, initially saw uh, caching as a performance boost. 
Yes, it is a performance boost uh, because in memory is faster than disk. But more importantly, it's a scalability need because you can you cannot scale without uh, something like this in your infrastructure. In fact, more and more companies are now almost making it a standard that just like they'll have a database in their application environment, they will also have a distributed cache. Some people call it in-memory data grid, which is on Java side, that's the term. Um, some people call it uh, data fabric, um, but distributed cache is the most common name for the .NET uh, ecosystem. So this is an infrastructure. Once you have it in place, you can use it uh, as a really, really powerful tool. Uh, the ratio between the application servers and the caching tier is usually about 4 to 1, 5 to 1, assuming that these are pretty loaded servers in terms of the transactions. Uh, you can go more than 5 to 1 also, depending on the nature of the use. And a typical cache server is about 16 gig to 32 gig in memory and dual CPU quad core type of configuration. So not a very high end box. In fact, you don't want a very high end box at this layer. Uh, it, you want more boxes than a few very high end boxes. Um, if you add more memory, you can go up to 128 or 256 gig memory, but more memory means uh, need to have a stronger CPU. Why is that? Because if you have more memory, your, your heap is bigger, your garbage collection is going to be a much bigger task, and garbage collection is not the fastest thing in .NET. Um, and uh, it, will, it, it will eat up your CPU, so you look more and more like a database. So it's better to have 16 to 32 gig is a pretty good uh, sweet spot per cache server. Any questions up until now? So now that, uh, and here's the scalability numbers of NCache. Uh, different caches would have different numbers, but the goal is to have this as a scalable. So the reads scale in this fashion, the writes are scaling in this. The reads are slower than writes because there's replication happening with reads. Um, and I'll talk about that, those capabilities. The reason you need replication is because memory is volatile. So if any one server goes down, you lose that data, so you don't want to lose that data in many cases. Uh, the goal of the talk up until now was to kind of show you why you need distributed caching. You know, and, and now that we've established that case, let's talk about what is it that you will use a distributed cache for. Uh, the most common use case is what I was talking about, which is an application data caching. You cache the data that exists in your database right here. So you cache as much of it as you can, um, and then you improve your performance and scalability. So the main thing to notice in application data caching use case is that the data exists in two places, one in the database, one in the cache. Whenever that happens, what's the first concern that comes to your mind? That what could go wrong if data existed in two places? Yeah, consistency. So uh, it's really important for a good distributed cache to handle that. Because if you're not, if a cache is not able to handle uh, the fact that data must be consistent in both places, then you are forced to cache uh, more read-only data. Uh, you know, and read-only data is about 10 to 15, 20 percent of your data. The majority of the data is what I call transactional data. These are your customers, your accounts. That's data that's changing. It might change every few seconds, although most of the time it might change every few minutes. Um, so even if you could cache it for one minute or 30 seconds, um, that you will still benefit because you will read it multiple times. And if you multiply that by the total number of transactions that are happening in a given day, you have millions of transactions that are no longer going to the database. So uh, the, it's really important that for application data caching, a good distributed cache must handle this consistency. And I'll, I'll go over those features that, that are really important to have that consistency. So application data caching caches permanent data. Per, permanent data means this exists in your database permanently. The second use case is if you have an ASP.NET application. This, of course, applies to other web applications too, but <coughs> I'm focusing on .NET. You can cache your session state, your view state, if you're not using the MVC framework, and you can cache your output, uh, the page output. 
all of that data is temporary in nature. It's not permanent. Any data that is not permanent should not really exist in the database. You know, um, it's, it's, a, it's a transient data. When data is transient, when it's temporary, um, and it's, it's not existing in the database, it's only existing in the cache, what's the biggest concern that comes to mind that what could go wrong? Or lack of it. So, so if you don't persist, you lose the data. You know, what if this cache server goes down? You know, and you have this shopping basket or whatever, uh, and let's say you're an airline and this customer of yours has just done this flight search and they're going to buy 10 tickets or at least four tickets worth at least uh, $5,000 and the last page um, they say submit order or, or whatever the last page and suddenly the session is gone because the cash server went down and they have to start all over again. Their entire activity is lost. You, know, you, you may lose that customer. Not a very good experience. So anything that you cash um, that is transient, the cash must replicate. Any cache that does not do replication is not uh, is, is not a viable cache, um, and replication has cost. So the cache must do uh, effective and efficient replication. The session state is a very common use case for a distributed cache because sessions are very common in ASP.NET. The third common or the third use case, which is actually not very commonly known is called runtime data sharing. Uh, this is if you have multiple applications that need to share, one application produces something or updates something that another application or the, and another instance of that application needs to use. Um, usually you would use message queues for this traditionally or you would just put that data in the database and the other application will poll. Um, but uh, a distributed cache is very, very good for that for that use case. Uh, it's not there to replace message queues. Message queues have their other use, but if your application is running in the same data center, all the instances, and they need to share data, then th this is a much more scalable uh, data or data sharing platform because all the applications are connected to the same platform. And this platform can fire off events in a pub sub model. Pub means one application is the publisher, they publish something and they fire off an event, all the subscribers of that will be notified and they will con consume that data. There's also a other types of notifications when certain items are modified, your application can show interest in certain items and if this item changes, notify me. Or there's a continuous query feature that NCache has, which is like a SQL dependency feature in SQL Server where NCache allows you to say uh, an SQL type of a a query, which let's say selects customers where customer.city is New York. So if any customer with this criteria is ever added, updated, or removed from the cache, notify me. So it's a much more intelligent way of monitoring changes to, to the cache. So all of those things allow you to uh, share data between applications in a very fast and scalable way at runtime. And this is also transient data, although many, much of that data exists in the database, but the form in which you're sharing it probably doesn't. So it's transient, so this must also be replicated. Any questions up, up until now? Either you guys know this stuff completely already, or I'm, I'm super good. <laughs> okay. So let's, let's go through uh, and see some source code in terms of how, how, what are the features that you should use and how to use them. I'm going to use NCache as the example, but as I said, my focus is more on the actual features. Uh, here's a typical way that you would use any cache. You would, you know, you try, try to load a customer from a database. Before you go to the database, you'll check the cache and you'll use a key, a string based key that says customers.customer ID and the actual customer ID, maybe 1000 or something. And you say, check the cache. If you have it in the cache, no need to go to the database. You've got it. If you don't have it in the cache, then uh, you go to the database, you load that customer, and you put it in the cache. When you put it in the cache, the next time you come, you or anybody else comes, they'll find it in the cache. So that's a very simple paradigm. Once you do this, everybody uh, gets to find things more and more in the cache. Of course, there's a lot of other features that you can pre-populate the cache with a lot of the data that you think is going to be needed anyway. Um, 
so that you you will save a lot of the database hits up front, and then you'll still incrementally keep adding data to the cache that is not found in the cache. Um, and actually, let me this is good time to show you a simple. So here's, for example, here's a Visual Studio project. Uh, if you were to use NCache, you would um, link two of the assemblies. One is ncache.runtime, one is ncache.web. Um, you will use two of the namespaces here, similarly ncache.runtime and .web.caching. We named our namespaces to be fairly close to ASP.NET cache, uh, so that the, you know, when ncache came out, ASP.NET cache was the only cache uh, available. Um, so you, you've got this, and at the beginning of your application, this is a console application, of course, but yours is going to be a different one. You'll connect to the cache, and you'll get a cache handle. Every cache is named, um, and you get a cache handle, and then you, you add your objects to the cache. So let's say you just added, you do cache.add here, and you specify your key, although it, this should probably not be David Jones, it should be customer ID of some sort. Uh, and uh, then you have the actual object, and, the, and you have specified expiration. So you've specified an absolute expiration of one minute. You're saying after one minute, expire this item from the cache. Everything else you just kept as default. And later on, you can do a cache.get and get that same customer from another place. So just a simple uh, uh, cache operations. Um, in case of ncache, all caches are named. I'm, I'm going to quickly you know show you what a cache looks like, and then we'll come back to the code. Um, I've set up uh, a bunch of VMs in Azure, so you, you can run ncache uh, in Azure, in Amazon, on and on premises. Um, in all cases, the cache servers themselves are just VMs. These are just Windows uh, 2008, 2012 VMs. The cache client. Uh, in, in Azure, it can either be a VM, it could be a web role, it could be a worker role, it could be a, uh, like a website. Um, but I'm going to log into the demo, actually, I have logged into the demo client uh, right here. I'm going to now quickly go and create a cache so, you know, so I can show that how cache looks like. So I'm, I'm going to put two, use this tool called NCache Manager. It's a graphical tool that lets you I'm going to come here and say create a new clustered cache. All caches in NCache are no are named, so I'm going to just name my cache. I'll take everything else as default at this time. I'll choose a topology called partition replica. I'll, I'll quickly go over that at the end of this talk. A partition replica is my topology. I'll use asynchronous replication. I'll pick my first cache server, which is demo2. Those are two my cache nodes. I'll hit next. I'll take all the defaults. I'll specify how much memory I want to allocate to this cache. So that way the cache will not consume more memory than this. I'm just going to pick one gig, but of course yours is going to be much larger. That's the, the size of a partition. Um, so once the cache uses that much memory, the cache is full. So either it will <coughs> reject any new items, or it's going to uh, evict some of the existing items. So I'm going to say evict 5% of the cache on this. And I'll say least recently uses the algorithm to, to use. And I've just created a cache. I'm going to go ahead and add a, a client to this. So I've just created a cache. I'm going to go ahead and start the cache. Do this 
statistics. So I can use some performance statistics. I'm going to also do monitor the cluster. And so I've just started a cache. This cache is called demo cache. I'm going to just quickly test it. So I just ran a, a stress test tool that comes with NCache. It lets you quickly test the cache in your own environment. So this cache is now working. So what is happening is on the on the on the client box, and the client means your application server box. I've got uh, a configuration file right here, and. Uh, So I just created cache and it now knows what the cache servers are. Okay, now, now I want to go back to the code. So when I actually pick this cache name, so I, when I pick this cache name, then this is what actually happened. My application now connected to all the cache servers in the cluster. Uh, and gave me a cache handle so that when I do a cache.add, it's going to actually go and add it to the appropriate place in the cache and also do the replication all for me. All of that is done. So the API hides all of that detail, but I wanted to show you what that cache looks like behind the scenes and how easy it is to use and cache in that situation. So let's come back to our uh, main. Here's what the API would lo look like. You do a cache.get, cache.get, Contains, cache out, add, insert, remove. Insert means add if it doesn't exist, otherwise update it. Um, okay, now that we've got an idea of what a cache looks like, what is a, a, a specific, like a simple API, let's come to the features that we talked about, which are important for a distributed cache. So the first thing that we had said is that a distributed cache must keep the data fresh, the cache fresh. So there are four ways that it can do that. Number one is expiration, which a lot of caches have. Almost every cache allows you to expire things. So there's an absolute expiration and there's a sliding expiration. Absolute expiration is what I just showed you, which is it says expire this item, let's say five minutes from now, regardless of what happens. And the reason I say this is because I say, you know, this data exists in the database and I can only trust it for five minutes that it's not going to be changed in the database. I don't want to keep it for more than that in the cache because it might change in the database. So you're making a guess about the nature of the data. Some data you can cache for hours and days. You know, this may be your lookup tables. Uh, maybe you, your, your pricing changes once a day or something. So, so you, you can cache this for 24 hours. Other data is your transactional data. You can cache it only for maybe 30 seconds or one minute um, because that's as long as you feel comfortable. Um, so absolute expiration is for permanent data, and it's one way of you estimating or guessing how long is it safe to keep the data in the cache. It's a very important uh, distinction that I want to make between the absolute expiration and sliding. Sliding expiration basically says remove this item from the cache when nobody is touching it anymore for this interval. Um, touching means fetching or updating. So, uh, for example, a session state, when you log out, a session state is no longer being touched by anybody. So, after 20 minutes or so, it needs to be removed from the cache. Sliding expiration is used for tra transient data, usually. It's more of a cleanup operation. It has nothing to do with keeping data fresh. It has to do with just getting rid of it because you no longer need it. But absolute expiration is what you need to keep the data fresh. Uh, secondly, so, uh, you know, expressions is a very important feature. Every cache must have it, and most of them do. In fact, I think all, all of them at least do absolute expression. The second feature is something most of them don't do. And th this is where you want to synchronize the cache with the database. You say, you know, I really can't predict how frequently or when is, is this going to update in the database. I don't know when the data is going to update in the database. Because I've got multiple applications that are updating it. There may be other people who are directly touching the data. 
So I just want the cache to monitor the database. So, and the cache should be aware of this change in the database. Uh, this is a feature that mCache has. Um, it's called SQL dependency. Actually, it uses a SQL Server feature called SQL dependency, uh, where mCache becomes a client of the database. So you specify, let me quickly show you what that looks like. Um, there. So if I have a cache here, so again, the same way we, we did the, uh, the libraries, and then you connect to the cache. Now when you're adding the cache, when you're adding the item to the cache, uh, right here, I come here and I say add product to the cache with dependency, go to the definition. So here, you're saying to this cache, here's my SQL statement. So your SQL statement usually re reflects that one row in the table. So if you're adding a product, it should be that SQL statement with the product ID equals this. So you're, you're creating this SQL statement for SQL Server because this is what you'll pass as part of the SQL dependency to SQL Server. You will pass it to NCache. So you on the client box is passing this to NCache. So you're specifying this as your SQL statement. You're creating a cache item object and within the cache item you're specifying a SQL Server dependency. So this is a, a SQL cache dependency is, is a class of NCache actually. It, it, this is not the same as the SQL Server dependency. This is a, it, sort of the same name, uh, except it's SQL Cache dependency. Uh, this creates that, uh, it keep, keeps that SQL statement. You specify that and you add the item to the cache. So you've done this and you are at this time sitting, oops, uh, you're sitting on this box right here. So you pass this on to NCache. It goes to one of the cache servers. This this cache server becomes a client of the database now, because you've specified connection string information also. Um, somewhere here, you 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 specify the connection string. So NCache server becomes a client of your database. Now that database could be SQL Server, that could be Oracle, um, and NCache will establish a SQL dependency connection. SQL Server will create a, a data structure within SQL Server that will monitor that data set. So just like NCache had that continuous query feature that I talked about for runtime data sharing, where NCache was monitoring all the customers where city, uh, customer that city was New York, now SQL Server is monitoring this data set within SQL Server. And if, that, if any row matching that criteria is either added, updated, or removed from SQL database, SQL Server notifies the cache server. The cache server now knows that this data has changed in the database. So it has two options. It can either remove that from the cache, which is the default behavior, or it can reload a new copy. The way it will reload a new copy is if you use another feature of NCache called read-through. And, and I'm going to skip this, and I'll, I'll actually come back to this. But So there's a feature called read-through. Uh, which is your code, you implement a read-through handler, and I'll show you the read-through handler. Uh, so let's say you've got a, uh, so here's a read-through, an I read through provider. You implement this, uh, it has an init method, which initializes it, a dispose method, and an actually like a get method. So the get passes you the key, and you give it back the cache item. So you go to the data source of yours and you load that item, you specify the expiration or any other thing and you pass it back to NCache. This code of yours runs on the cache server. This is an important thing to keep in mind with that. So the read through actually runs on the cache server itself. Actually, I have another diagram which probably so the read-through runs on the cache server itself. So the cache server has to be developed in .NET for your .NET code to run on it, right? So if you're a .NET shop, if your application in .NET, the reason I say the whole stack of yours should be .NET is for all of these benefits. So coming to, for example, Redis. Redis is a Linux-based cache. It's a, it's a great cache. I've got nothing against them. But uh, if you're a .NET shop, 
you need to do all of these things and your code must run on the cache server for the cache to be able to synchronize itself with the database and automatically reload that item from the database. Um, so your read through handler is what gets called uh, when, uh, when a SQL dependency fires, if you want it that way. If you don't want, then it's just going to remove that item from the cache. And then when it's removed from the cache, then the next time your application looks for it, it will not find it, and it's going to go and get it from the database. Now, in certain cases, for example, it's a, it's a, it's a product catalog that you cached, and you've just updated the price. Why remove the product from the cache? You've just updated the price. Because now the application has to have the logic to go and get it from the database. It's better to reload automatically. So a lot of the data, if you think is going to be needed over and over again, when either you're expiring it or when the database synchronization happens, it's better to reload it than to, to remove it. Because then the application does not have to do this. The more of this the cache does, the, the, the easier your application becomes. I have to speed it up, okay. So, Another uh, way that a cache can synchronize itself with the database, uh, so if you don't have SQL Server or Oracle, let's say you have MySQL or DB2, uh, then these two features don't exist, then you can use DB dependency, which is another feature of NCache that where NCache pulls a specific table. Uh, and you modify your database triggers to go and update the flag in that row, and the NCache picks it up and says, okay, this item has changed, so I need to either remove it or reload it. Um, CLR procedures is another way to synchronize the cache with the database, uh, where you actually write a CLR procedure, you call it from your uh, table trigger. So it, let's say if you have an, uh, an add or an update trigger or a delete, you call this CLR procedure, it calls NCache, or it, it, it calls the cache. In case of CLR procedure, you need to make sure that the cache supports async methods, which NCache does. So you, you can make a cache like an insert async call, and the control immediately comes back to you. Because if you don't do the async call, your database transactions are going to start timing out. Because you're updating multiple servers in the cache, you're going across the network, which is not what a database transaction is designed on. So you, you need to have async calls. So those are three ways that you can synchronize the cache. Um, so any cache that you pick, you need to make sure that you can keep the data fresh. And these are the two, two ways. And the same way, if you have a non-relational data source, let's say you have um, your data is in the cloud or it's any other place, you can even want to make a web method call. Um, you can actually implement a custom dependency, which is again your code that registers and runs on the cache servers. And NCache calls it and says, please go and check your data source if it, is, if it has changed or not. You check the data source. If it has changed, you notify NCache that data, that data source, the data in the data source has changed, so NCache can either remove it or reload it. So again, uh, with, a, with a relational database, NCache does it all for you. Uh, in case of non-relational, you have to do a custom dependency. The final uh, aspect of keeping their cache fresh is the cache dependency feature. Uh, where you, let's say if you have a one-to-many relationship between a customer and an order, and you're caching both of them. Um, what if the customer object is removed from the cache? Uh, should the orders remain in the cache or not? What if you actually deleted the customer from the database? Well, you don't really delete customers, but I'm saying in a one-to-many. Let's say, what if the one side you removed from the cache really meant that you, you might have removed it from the da database also? That means that the many side is no longer valid. So uh, who should keep track of all of this? Uh, if the cache can do it for you, you know, then it makes your life much simpler. For example, uh, ASP.NET cache object has this feature called cache dependency. Uh, and cache has implemented it. And uh, as far as I know, no, no other .NET cache has this feature. Um, but it, basically, you register the relationship between items. Say, this depends on this item. If this item is ever updated or removed, please automatically remove this item. So the cache does the cleanup for you. The more of this the cache does for you, the better it is for you because you can rest assured that your data is going to be fresh. Once you have this confidence, you can cache pretty, pretty much all data. And it's just a matter of which strategy you will use to keep the data fresh. Any questions?
I think I'm really good. Okay. Um, so now that you have the confidence of data being fresh, you'll start caching a lot of data. Well, once you start caching a lot of data, the next thing that comes is, well, the cache is now starting to look more and more like a database. It's not a database. It's always a temporary store. But especially a lot of that reference data, you pretty much store the entire data set into the cache. Um, when that happens, you want to be able to search on it. Instead of just always finding it based on keys, that's very inconvenient. Finding any item based on key is not always convenient. You want to be able to search them through other means. One way is to do an SQL search. Again, select customers where customer.city is New York. Just like you would do, or you would say, give me all my um, products of this category. Um, so you'll get a collection of those objects back from the cache, not from the database. Coming from the cache means, of course, that the database no longer has to take that hit uh, and it's all in memory, it's, it's, all, it's much, much faster because it's coming from multiple servers at the same time. So all of these are parallel queries. And um, for you to be able to do this, the cache must support indexing, which NCache does. Uh, I'm not sure what other uh, products do or not, but make sure that, that the cache supports indexing. Otherwise, these will be really, really slow queries. Um, another uh, one thing that you cannot do in a cache is join multiple objects or multiple tables, which is what you can do in a relational database. So there are ways around it, uh, which is that you can group things, you can tag them um, in certain ways that you can get them back. Um, and that way you can fetch data based on some logical associations or grouping uh, that is in the cache. So let's say if you've cached everything, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. For example, let's say you've cached, um, uh, let's say that you've, you've gotten a collection of customers back. Um, Let's say that if you have a, okay, so here it, if you see I'm, I'm caching I've got a collection of objects back, uh, and I want to cache every object separately into the cache. But later on, I, I want to be able to fetch it all in one call. So either I issue the same query, uh, SQL query, and I say, give me all those things back. But I, I got these objects from the database. I, I didn't get them from the cache. And they're not an entire data set. Let's say they're, they're whatever set that I wanted to fetch at that time. So. I am, I've cached every object individually because I might need to access it individually. But I want to be able to fetch it all back as one collection. So I use the concept of a tag. I tag them all with the same tag. Uh, and that ta tag could be any unique string. And I say, give me all the items that have this tag back. So in one call, I'm going to get all that entire collection back again. So it's that type of stuff that you can do with tags um, that kind of makes it up for the lack of... Um, joins in the cache. So, oops. so you can do grouping, you group and subgroup, you can do tags, you can do name tags. Name tags are essentially you have a key and then a value. So if you're caching, for example, text, freeform text, um, there's no way to index that text on its own because it's, it's text. So you have to make up the tags yourself. And just tag itself may not be sufficient. You want to be able to name every tag. So just like an, an object has attribute names. So the name tag is like attributes of an object. 
So the name could be city and the value in this text could be New York or Las Vegas. Um, so you know you, you can do all that stuff and then later fetch those things. And you should and in case of end catch at least you can use you can specify all of this either through the API or through the SQL query. So when you're fetching something based on SQL, right. first question, great. Can we can we use a hierarchical taxonomies? For instance, categories instead of tax because tax are flat. Because you can have country, city, and so on. Right. What, what you can do actually is uh, the group and subgroups gives you only one level of hierarchy. So within a group, you can have multiple subgroups, but you can't go beyond it. Uh, you can use uh, different types of tags to represent, um, because you, you can assign multiple tags to one item. So for example, if you had multiple hierarchies, you can assign, for every, every level that you go down, you can assign all of the top, yeah, every level as a separate tag. Question, huh? uh, do we have control over the internal representation of the cache? For instance, can we decide to use a tree or a flat structure key value? Um, the, the cache builds, the indexes are built based on a combination of hash table and, in case of end cache, and uh, red black trees. Um, you, you can choose the indexes, but you don't choose uh, what the data structure is going to be used internally. But the indexes are built based on the nature of the use. So for for example, hash tables are good for certain types of access. And if you're going to do the range type of searches, then red black trees are much better. So, but NCache does it. That I, I don't know what other products do, but uh, NCache indexes stuff quite a bit. So we've got another 10, 10 11 minutes. Uh, let me quickly go through the read through, write through. So, why do you want read through and write through? Uh, read through, we've seen one example of it, which is that you can reload stuff automatically. Um, another benefit of read through is, of course, you're, you're consolidating as much of your data access into the cache itself. The more you access, the more of that that goes into the cache or caching layer, the less it is in your application. And the application becomes simpler. The application does just a cache.get. Um, and of course, the other benefit of that was that you can automatically reload stuff. Write through is in the same fashion. One benefit is that you're consolidating all the writes. Um, the second benefit is that you can actually speed up your writes. So, for example, write behind is a feature where you update the cache synchronously, and cache updates the database asynchronously. So, if the database updates are not as fast as the cache, which is true. Um, then your application performance suddenly improves because you will only update the cache and the cache updates the database. Um, so the read through and write through and write behind come are really very powerful features that you should take advantage of. This is all also server side code that you write that runs on the cache cluster. Um, and uh, you know it simplifies your life um, to so that your application can have more and more of the data in the cache, and also update it through the cache. Let me quickly go through, I'm gonna come back to this, let me quickly go through and talk about something else. I'm, going, I'm not gonna go into the detail of ASP.NET session state caching, just know that you can just plug it in without any code change, you just make changes in the web.config and it just automatically takes care of it and the same thing goes with view state and output caching. I'm going to quickly go through uh, a couple of things. First, I wanted to talk about um, any cache that you use because you're, you know, it's it's an it's like a database. It's an in-memory database in production. So a cache must be highly available. You must have highly available cache. Um, and cache is highly available in the in through a, a couple of things. That it does. First, it has a dynamic cache cluster. You can add or remove servers at runtime, and it automatically readjusts the cluster. You don't have to hard code the server names in the config. The clients automatically, once once a client talks to any cache server, it gets a cluster membership information. If the membership changes at runtime, let's say you add a new node or you drop a node, the updated membership is propagated to the client. So that's the first part that must be there. It, it's really important that you to to see it that way. The second is 
the caching topology. So there are different ways that NCache, for example, gives you four caching topologies. The first is called a mirrored cache. It's a two node active passive. Uh, the second is called replicated cache, where every server in the cache has a copy of the entire cache. So the more servers you have, the more copies of the cache you have. It's scalable for read, not scalable for updates, but it has its own use cases. Um, the third topology is called partition cache, where the entire cache is broken up into partitions. Every server has one partition, um, and uh, <coughs> these partitions are created automatically. Um, so for example, in case of mCache, each partition has a number of buckets inside it. So the total cluster has 1,000 buckets. So if you have three partitions, they have one-third, one-third number of buckets. Um, and partition replica is the same as partition, but every partition is backed up onto a different server. And all of that is done automatically for you. So when you uh, create a two-node cluster, you can have two partitions and two replicas. When you add a third server, automatically a third partition is created. And when a third partition is created, some of the buckets have to move from existing partitions. So all of that is done automatically for you. A new replica is automatically created. In fact, if you see it from this, let me just show you that no, no, uh, here. Let's say if you had a two server partition. Uh, but let's say if you only had a two server cluster, you only had two partitions. Partition one was here and replica one, partition two, replica two. Now you added a third server. Suddenly you have to have a third partition and th this will get some of the buckets from here, some of the buckets from here, that's one thing. Second, the replica two is no longer going to be here, it's going to move here because now, you know, partition, uh, the replica for partition three has to be here. So all of that adjustment is, is automatically done for you by NCache. So that's one thing. Second, there's a feature uh, called client cache. Some people call it near cache, which is really powerful that you must use, uh, which is basically it's a, it's a local cache within your client application. But there's one special thing about this, that this local cache is not disconnected with the cluster, the cache cluster. It is connected to the cache cluster. It kept, it keeps itself synchronized. So in case of NCache, for example, the client cache plugs in automatically behind the scenes through config. You, whatever you fetch from each of these application servers is what is, um, is what is automatically kept in the client cache. So the next time you need it, you'll find it in the client cache. And, and the cache cluster knows which data is in which client cache. So if that data changes by, let's say, another client, the, the cluster notifies all the client caches that have that data to go and update themselves. So the client cache stays connected, but it is a local cache. It can even be in proc. In proc means within your application process. So that really speeds up your uh, performance, but at the same time, you're uh, part of the, the overall connected distributed cache. I'm going to skip a lot of the stuff because we don't have time. So there's also WAN replication. If you have multiple data centers, you should be able to have the cache replicate itself across the WAN. And that cannot, you can't build a cluster across the WAN. That will just die because these sockets break, the latency is just very, very high. So there has to be some way of connecting caches across to uh, data centers. In case of NCache, we have this thing called bridge topology. Uh, which connects multiple data centers. You, you can have active, 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 passive, or even more than two data centers now. Um, and that way, and this is all done asynchronously, and there's also conflict resolution done for you. So as, as you can see, a, um, um, a, a cache is not just a simple key value store. There's a lot that you should keep in mind behind the scenes. What, one thing I quickly wanted to cover was NCache versus Redis, just a high le level, I wanted to talk about this. Um, uh, NCache is a native .NET cache. Um, it runs on Windows, um, and you can do both the client side and the server side caching. That's one benefit. Uh, wh whereas Redis is mainly a Linux based cache. Uh, before Microsoft did partnership with them, you know, most people on .NET side didn't even know they existed, even though they have been a very popular cache on on the Unix and PHP and other environments. Um, secondly, uh, the Linux version of NCache is what is available on Azure as a cache as a service. So the reason it's cache as a service is because for .NET applications, you can't really run server-side code um, 
on a Linux based cache. You have to have a .NET based cache for you to run. So that's one huge limitation that you will get. Uh, third, if you're going to do anything outside of Azure, um, Redis uh, is only available as a Linux based cache. The Windows port that Microsoft did is, is something that they don't use themselves. Even on Azure, they don't choose to use the Windows because it's not very stable. Um, so I think those are the really high level. There's also more detail if you if you want to see a more detailed comparison between NCache and uh, Redis. You can come here and come here and, and see comparisons. So yeah, we've got comparisons with everybody because we're so confident about us ourselves that we publish everything. So as you can see, this is a full blown co comparison. Just go through it. If you are thinking about using a distributed cache, which you should if you have all those scalability needs, do your homework, make sure that whatever you use fits your needs. Um, and uh, as far as NCache is concerned, we'll make it easy for you to compare NCache with others. You can come to our website and download NCache. It's open source. You can download either the Enterprise Edition or the open source one here, or you can go to GitHub and you'll have NCache here. That's the end of my presentation. Any questions? Are you recalling the uh, SQL dependency models mm -hmm. that I passed the frame and query text? You right. pass an EO command object? You can a pass a, a store procedure call, but it has to be all SQL, like the transact SQL stuff that will run within SQL Server itself. Okay. Can a server be both the Yes, so the cache can be on the same server as the application. We don't recommend it as a good, it's not a good deployment strategy, but if you have a small configuration, yes, of course. Actually, when you do partitioning, all of the partitioning is done for you. So the whole idea is that every partition should be equal in, in its weight, in terms of data size, in terms of transactions. So I don't control... You, you, you don't control the partitions, you just know that they exist. Right. When you're updating that item table, uh, you, you, you can choose to update the cache from within the database itself. By If you have a CLR procedure, that can make a call straight from the database to the cache. You can also um, write separate code that can go and update the cache. It all depends on how much of that you are trying to keep in the cache. So, uh, you know, I can talk about it more offline if you want, but I mean, there are multiple ways that you can make sure that all that data that you need to access is kept fresh in the cache. Is, uh, do you have Yes, actually, I'm going to make the slides available. Uh, you know, we'll email you. We'll part of the reason we scanned everybody so that we can do that, and we'll also have the video recorded uh, and uploaded so that you you can watch and also your colleagues can watch. Oh, you you can get sent. Come to our booth. Uh, it's it's uh, actually our booth. Just come to our booth and we'll scan you. Uh, actually per application or actually even across multiple applications. So it all depends on the transaction load. You should have a minimum of two cache servers to, just to have the cluster. And then the number of servers depends on how many application servers you have, or how much how much activity you have basically, how much data you're going to cache, how much reads and writes are you doing. It doesn't matter, yeah. Yeah, everything will, will continue to work. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.